pleased to welcome Hajun Cheng. Um, I am Robert Wade. I'm a professor. Did somebody say something? <laughs> I'm a professor in the uh, what used to be called the Development Studies Institute. Um, it's been upgraded to a department. My favorite uh, alternative name was Overseas Development Department because the acronym was odd. <laughs> um, but it was uh, decided to call it the Department of International Development. Um, let me briefly introduce Hajun and the book that he's going to be uh, speaking to. Um, Hajun was educated in Korea at high school and undergraduate economics at Seoul National University. Um, his father, and this I think is an interesting point, family <laughs> background. I have a degree in anthropology, which is why it particularly interests me, but you want to understand where he's coming from in terms of his approach to economics. I think this family background is relevant. His father was a senior civil servant in the Korean Ministry of Finance during the Park Chung-hee regime up to 1979 when Park was assassinated, but those were the critical decades of Korea's development. Um, he then became, the father that is, then became head of the government housing bank. Um, he was then kicked out by the incoming military government. Um, he then became an MP, and for a short time he was minister of industry. So that's the kind of household that Hajun <laughs> grew up in. Uh, Hajun came to Cambridge in 1986 to do a master's in economics, then a PhD in economics. And he joined the faculty of economics at Cambridge in 1990, where he has remained ever since. He is the author of a great many scientific papers. And just let me hold up a recent new book in which he has a very good paper. It's called Towards New Developmentalism. And it's a set of essays about new thinking uh, in in development, economics, development studies. The subtitle is Market as Means Rather Than Master, which is very much the subject that Hajun uh, writes about. Um, I have an essay in here too, by the way. Um, <laughs> the title, just to remind you, is Towards New Developmentalism by uh, Khan and Christensen. However, in addition to Hajun's uh, many scientific papers, um, he has written several um, what you could call popular and articulate books about uh, development issues, titles like Kicking Away the Ladder and Bad Samaritans. These were very good books, but the book that we're launching tonight is a real tour de force. Um, it has the rare quality of being very entertainingly and articulately written while covering a vast scope, a magisterial scope, including some of the hottest issues of our time going well beyond issues of development. Um, one uh, exception to that I have to note, and perhaps we'll come back to this, is uh, anything much to do with environmental constraints or climate change. Um, I plead guilty. Yeah. But we, will, we will come back to that, I'm sure. Um, so the book, the book is launched at a time when few people are now um, aggressively, as they were, championing neoliberal economics. But there remains a very strong inertial momentum. I've just come back from the World Bank doing research on new thinking and development economics, at least that's what I thought I was going to do mm -hmm. research on, because the chief economist of the bank since 2007 is Justin Lin, a Chinese national, the first ever non-G7 chief economist of the World Bank. And Justin Lin is sort of pushing or nudging um, thinking or trying to nudge thinking in the World Bank in the direction of what you could call Hajun Chang, in this kind of direction, and away from a kind of hard neoliberal economics. But, as I discovered, he is facing very strong pushback from many uh, economists around the bank, including in the research complex of the bank, who makes 
made statements to me like, oh, for every career there are a hundred failures, failure deficits of countries that have apparently tried to do Korea. So obviously we, the bank, cannot endorse anything that the Koreans did. That's the kind of what you have to call stupid thinking <laughs> that continues to prevail as a kind of inertial <coughs> momentum. People are very, very anxious about rethinking um, settled um, opinions. So, um, th th and the problem is then that so far there has not been much of a social democratic, what you could call a social democratic alternative developed to neoliberal economic ideas um, so far. But it may be that the time is ripe right now at this time of quite a lot of uncertainty um, for uh, minds to be sprung open and uh, certainly my hope is that this book uh, may help to do it. So Harjun is going to speak for something like 45 minutes and then we will <coughs> open this up for your questions and discussions. Harjun. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robert, uh, for that <coughs> kind uh, introduction. Um, well, as you can see, this book has definitely the weirdest cover for an economics book in history. Now, don't ask me about the cover. I mean, depending on my mood, I blame or praise my publisher for coming up with this uh, unique cover. Uh, yeah, today I'm feeling quite generous, uh, so I think uh, this is uh, fantastic. Some days I think uh, this is uh, th the worst cover you can think of. The book also has uh, probably the weirdest uh, title for an economics book. I mean, uh, there I use the word probably rather than definitely, because uh, there could be some other book uh, which has even weirder title. Now, oh, one second. Why 23 things? Well, some people thought it was because of this guy. Uh, where is he? Yes. <laughs> Michael Jordan, the legendary American basketball player. Well, actually, I don't watch basketball. I'm a big fan of baseball, but uh, basketball, I didn't even know that, that uh, Jordan's uh, number was uh, 23. Other thought I was into the so-called 23 enigma in numerology, where all important events are somehow connected to number 23. Don't ask me how. As apparently argued in the Illuminatus trilogy and the movie The Number 23. <laughs> well, actually, I've never heard of this uh, 23 enigma before, so count that out. And some more learned people have conjectured that I'm a brilliant mathematician and must be referring to uh, the famous 23 mathematical problems of uh, the German mathematician David Hilbert. Oops, this guy. Well, I actually have no idea what that was. So uh, it wasn't that. Well, 23 is essentially a random number. You know, the, how it happened was that, that the working title of the book was uh, 20 things they don't tell you about capitalism. <laughs> but one day I was uh, having coffee with uh, my literary agent, uh, Ivan Mulcahy, in the cafe at uh, Paul the, on top of uh, Paddington Station. We were talking about the book, at, and, and at one point, uh, the, without any prompting, uh, we looked at each other and said, 20 things, that's a bit boring, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> So I said, uh, yeah, uh, I could easily write another dozen things, but that would make the book too long. So let's start, uh, sorry, the cap the number at 25 and start there. Well, 25 is a bit obvious. I don't like even numbers. 21, too close to 20. <laughs> so that uh, left uh, 23, huh? <laughs> I know, I know. This is a bit like a sketch in Monty Python, huh? the famous uh, parrot scene, and so on. But actually, the, this uh, the story, in a way, sums up the spirit with which the book was 
written. It is a light-hearted book with a serious purpose, as my U.S. publisher, Bloomsbury USA, described. And I mean, uh, in a way, it's uh, quite weird. I mean, uh, one book review in the, the Prospect magazine described my book uh, as uh, the general theory rewritten by Borges, the Argentinian writer. I mean, the reviewer that didn't that, that think it was a compliment, but uh, being a fan of Borges, uh, I take it as a compliment. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there is uh, that uh, quirky, playful uh, the side to it, but uh, it talks about uh, the very serious issues in a very serious way. Huh? Okay, so now, as uh, Monty Python used to say, it, uh, for something completely different. Well, basically, the book will uh, tell you that a lot of things that you thought you knew about capitalism are at best partial truth and at worst downright myth. Yeah? So for example, the, yeah, these are the guys uh, from Cat in the Hat. Probably you have uh, forgotten about it because uh, the last time you read, uh, read it, you were seven. <laughs> well, thing one says uh, there is no such thing as a free market. Now that's weird. Because that uh, you know, you say, well, we may or may not like the free market, but we know what it is. Yeah? At least when we see one, we know what it is, don't we? Yeah? Well, actually, we don't. Yeah? Now, take an example of this uh, the legislation tabled in the British Parliament back in 1819. This was a law to regulate child labor. This uh, proposed uh, regulation was incredibly that, that, that weak uh, by modern standards. It would ban the employment of only very young children, that is, those under the age of nine. And my son's just turned 10, so he uh, would have been eligible to work in that regime. Although I already wrote a, a chapter titled, My Six-Year-Old Son Should Work, uh, the, uh, Get a Job in my earlier book, Bad Samaritans. Older children aged between 10 and 16 would, were allowed to work, but with their working hours restricted to what? Well, only 12 hours, yeah? The new rules only applied to cotton factories, which were re recognized to be exceptionally hazardous to workers' health. So you'd uh, say, well, what kind of regulation is this? Uh, this is a joke. But even that was met by a very stiff opposition by free marketeers who argued, well, essentially, these children want and need to work, and these factory owners want to employ them. What is your problem? Yeah? You know, freedom of contract is foundation of a free market. Yeah? Today, even the most enthusiastic supporters of free market policies, at least in the rich countries, would want to bring back child labor to liberalize labor market. Yeah? Well, at least I haven't met one that met one that who says it openly. <laughs> this uh, shows that, like beauty, freedom of a market is the is in the eyes of the beholder. That is, there's no scientific way to define a free market. Huh? So what is a free market that, that to some people may be seen as market riddled with regulation? Huh? The point is that like those uh, the kung fu masters you see in movies, huh? I mean, these guys are actually flying on piano wires, but uh, that, uh, they don't show it. So you think uh, they are really flying. Yeah? Like those guys, all markets are propped up by numerous regulations on what can be sold and bought, who can sell and buy them, and how the exchange may be conducted. Yeah? And I'm not talking about, yeah, kind of about uh, heavy things like uh, slaves, yeah? uh, the, the child labor. Yeah? You know, the, do you think that, that, that you can... The, take a bag of shares uh, of your company to London Stock Exchange and sell them, but uh, outside uh, the exchange building? No. Mm. 
in order to sell your shares, you have to go through very rigorous you know, regulatory process. I mean, they have to look at your accounts over a period and making sure that, that, that you are not involved in fraud, you, know, you do your uh, due diligence and everything. So even the, the stock market, you, which you think is very free, is uh, that, uh, bound by a lot of regulation. Huh? So in this sense, we think a market is free only because we so totally approve of the regulations that are propping up that particular market that we don't see them. Yeah? And that's that, uh, a very important point. Free market economists like to portray all regulations as politically motivated uh, interferences in the free workings of a natural system. However, when there is no way to scientifically define a free market, free market positions are as political as any other position. So breaking away from the illusion of market objectivity, thing one ends by saying, is the first step towards understanding capitalism. You know, I mean, that this is a very important starting point. Because the free market economy will tell you, look, we know how, where the right boundary of the market is. Yeah? Anyone who wants to mess around with it is a uh, populist or yeah, backed by unions or left-winger or yeah, uh, economically illiterate. Yeah? But actually, there's uh, no such boundary. Yeah? So that they, are, I mean, they want to pretend that, that, that they are scientists and others are yeah, politically motivated, but their politics is as political as other people's politics. Yeah? Okay, thing two says companies uh, should not be run in the interest of their owners. Well, this sounds crazy, huh? Shareholders own companies, so they have the biggest stake in the, the success of the company, and therefore what is good for the shareholders must be good for the company. Huh? Then why do I say something like this? Huh? Well, the problem is that in modern limited liability companies with dispersed ownership, Despite being the legal owners, most shareholders are actually the least committed to the long-term future of the company because they are the freest to leave. Yeah? So in the last three decades, with increasing financial deregulation, these uh, free-floating shareholders have become even more powerful that hired managers have basically decided to run the company for the, <clears throat> for the sake of uh, shareholder value maximization. Huh? You must have uh, heard this term so often. Huh? So what they do is that uh, they maximize short-term profit by not spending in things that improve long-term productivity. Huh? So they don't invest, they don't do R&D, yeah? they da, 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 do not train workers. I mean, I'm not saying that they do zero of these things. Yeah? but uh, they do the minimum that, 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 is, that they can get away with. And in that process, they ma maximize uh, their short-term profit and give away an ever-increasing share of that profit to the shareholders through increased dividends and share buybacks. So for example, in the United States, uh, dividends used to be around 40% of profit until the 1970s, now it's over 60%. Huh? And given that uh, retained profits is the biggest source of uh, the investment finance in the, the companies in the, the developed countries, this has a big impact on the, the investment. Huh? And the result has been long-term decline of the companies which adopted uh, such strategy, General Motors, General Electric, yeah, Ford, you name it, so much so that Jack Welch, the former CEO of uh, General Electric and the champion of shareholder value maximization, recently admitted that shareholder value maximization was, and I'm quoting him, the dumbest idea in the world. Yeah? Well, it's a bit too late uh, to say that, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> well, as for thing three, what do I mean by this? Yeah? Most people in rich countries are paid more than they should be. Well, we have been told by free market economists that people are paid what they are worth 
So we should not complain about pay differentials and income inequality. Eh? Because if uh, someone's uh, paid uh, 95 million pounds a year, he must be worth it. Yeah? Otherwise, the market wouldn't tolerate. Yeah? Now, leave that uh, and, uh, the aside for the moment. This uh, has also made us think that, well, you know, all those poor people in poor countries, they must be poor because uh, they are not very productive. They are not worth yeah, uh, very much. But as I do in the book, uh, take the case of two bus drivers. I named them Ram, an Indian guy from Rajasthan that, uh, driving bus in New Delhi. And uh, another guy is uh, called Sven. He is a Swedish guy driving bus in Stockholm. Sven gets uh, paid about 50 times what Ram does. But is it because uh, Sven is a driver who's, uh, that, uh, who drives uh, 50 times better? Well, that I'm not <laughs> sure whether it is that, uh, physically possible that uh, someone drives 50 times better than someone else, you know, unless you are uh, comparing you know, the Lewis Hamilton or Michael Schumacher with me. <laughs> but actually, when you think about it, if anything, Ram will be the better driver. And this picture will that, uh, show you why. You know, every minute of his driving, he has to dodge the cow, dodge the rickshaw, dodge the children, dodge the bicycle, stack uh, three meters high with the, the crates. You know, he has to be very good. Yeah? Whereas uh, Sven, you know, he can, uh, yeah, except for a few drunken drivers on Saturday night, uh, he can basically do his job as far as he can drive straight because he drives in a city like this. Yeah. yeah. So how come yeah, a guy who's at, uh, actually a much better driver gets paid one fiftieth, two percent of another guy who is essentially doing the same job with uh, less skill? Yeah? How is this possible? Well, this is possible only because of, uh, well, let me put it uh, bluntly, that uh, protectionism, that is immigration control. And if you actually totally free immigration, 80, maybe even 90% of the workforce in the rich countries can be and will be displaced. And I'm not just talking about bus drivers and cleaners. Huh? There, there, there are millions of bankers, engineers, and medical doctors waiting out there in China, Nigeria, and Brazil that can uh, replace their counterparts in the United States, Japan, and Britain. Huh? Why not? Well, after all, I replaced uh, a British economist. Yeah? <laughs> now, I'm not advocating a full liberalization of uh, immigration. Yeah? Even as an immigrant, I know that uh, that is yeah, uh, not possible or desirable. But if they are to be consistent, free market economists uh, should actually advocate it. Huh? But very few free market economists uh, even see that. I mean, uh, TN Srinivasan is uh, probably the only uh, exception. You know, Finn's Cable once uh, said something half like that, but I mean, other free market economists are not even aware that what they are saying about you know, free trade and that the free movement of people are contradictory. You know? Once again, the fact that uh, very few free market economists that, uh, that actually do this proves my earlier point that markets are fundamentally political constructs. Yeah? There's nothing in economics which says that yeah, British immigration per year should be 50,000 or 100,000. Yeah? No, it's the, the not determined by economics. Huh? Now, the flip side of this story is that poor countries are poor not because of the poor people, but because of the rich people of those countries. You know, uh, when you meet uh, rich people from poor countries, they'll tell you that if you would uh, listen to how their countries are dragged down by all those useless people who are lazy, ignorant, and unenterprising. Yeah? But actually, what they don't realize is that their countries are poor because of themselves, not because of their poor people, because most poor people in poor countries 
can hold their own against the rich country counterparts. Actually, many of them are more skilled, like our RAM. Yeah? But the, the rich in poor countries cannot actually do that. Huh? So it is that, that uh, if I put it that way, their failure to pull the rest of the country up rather than their poor pulling the rest of the country down, that is making poor countries poor. Okay, so th that now leaves the rich in the rich countries. Can they pat themselves on the back and tell us that, well, we you know, truly deserve what, they, uh, what we earn? Well, I don't think so. Because what these people don't often realize is that their high productivity critically depends on the fact that they were born into or at least uh, migrated to societies with advanced technologies, well-organized firms, good institutions, and high-quality physical infrastructure. And most of these are things that have been collectively accumulated over time and not something those individuals have created themselves. Yeah? Warren Buffett, the famous American in, uh, the investor, financial investor, once uh, put it beautifully in an interview. He said, look, I'm rich only because I happen to have been born in the United States. Yeah? Drop me in the middle of Bangladesh. Yeah? I'll be a struggling farmer. I'm not very good at farming, yeah? so I'll be rubbish. Yeah? So all of this uh, that, uh, back and forth uh, stuff about yeah, poor people in rich countries, rich, that, uh, poor people in uh, poor countries, yeah, rich people in uh, poor countries, and rich people in rich countries show the fundamentally collective nature of individual productivity without recognizing which we can build a truly fair system of compensation. Yeah? So we should be that, that, uh, able and willing to challenge yeah, these that, 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 uh, bankers uh, when they say, well, market yeah, uh, paid me yeah, $85 million, that, that dollars, that, that, so you shut up. No, you should that, that point to him that, look, I mean, the reason why you are getting this money is uh, because we have uh, a certain kind of uh, that, uh, economic system, certain kind of financial yeah, system with uh, that certain kind of regulation and deregulation and that uh, you haven't actually created all the wealth uh, that you think uh, you have uh, created. Huh? You know, I mean, that, that, just to give you an example, I mean, that in the United States, uh, the profit rate of the financial firms doubled or almost uh, trebled over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Huh? Is it because uh, they really became that much more productive? No, it's uh, because of deregulation. Yeah? You know, when the pa <laughs> Hank Paulson the, the abolished the uh, leverage regulation on financial firms, he basically yeah, gave them free money. Yeah? Because now, now they could have a uh, debt equity ratio of uh, 5,000 percent. Yeah? Whereas uh, the previously, it was, I think, uh, the cap that something like uh, 12 hundred or something like that. Yeah? Anyway, the details are not that important at this stage. Well, I mean, I obviously cannot go on like this. Uh, things one, two, three, four, and five, and six, and so on. So I give you a yeah, uh, flavor of uh, the kind of things I say. I mean, things that sound very outrageous, but I hope that uh, you get to accept uh, by the end of the chapter. So you know, despite the fall of communism, we are still living in planned economies. The washing machine has changed the world more than the internet has. I mean, that, that uh, attracted a lot of attention. <laughs> Making rich people richer doesn't make the rest of us richer. Financial markets need to become less, not more efficient. Equality of opportunity may not be fair. We are not smart enough to leave things to the market. Good economic policy does not require good economists. Yeah, that may be very popular. Eh? <laughs> and finally, yeah, people in poor countries are more entrepreneurial than people in rich countries. Now, I can't talk about any of these, but I chose two of them, given the time constraints, mainly because uh, they uh, give me excuse to use some nice pictures. 
So let's uh, look at uh, thing 13. Making rich people richer doesn't make the rest of us richer. You know, for the last three decades, free market economies have advocated policies that basically redistribute income upward, yeah? deregulation of business, tax costs for the rich, cuts in welfare spending, and so on. And the justification was that, look, I mean, initially this might yeah, make other people the poorer, but when you make rich people richer, we will eventually make everyone richer because the rich will now have more money to invest and create more wealth. Yeah? So wealth has to be created before it can be shared out. Yeah? That was uh, the typical mantra. And this is, uh, of course, a classic uh, free market logic going back to the days of at least uh, the David Ricardo, if not Adam Smith. Yeah? I mean, that, uh, unlike uh, neoclassical economies of today, the classical economists that uh, saw the society in classes. Yeah? So Ricardo said that uh, there is uh, the capitalist class, there is the working class, and there is the landlord class. Yeah? And basically, you have to uh, give as much wealth uh, to the capitalist class because they are the ones who are going to invest. They are the ones who are going to that, that, yeah, that, that develop the economy. So the, the logic is that investable surplus needs to be concentrated in the hands of the investor, in this case the capitalist class, and that's the way to maximize investment and therefore growth. Now the interesting thing is that this is exactly the logic behind the agricultural collectivization implemented by Joseph uh, Stalin. Well, the, the logic was that Given that most of the economic surplus in the Soviet Union in the 1920s was in the agriculture sector, which invested very little of it because that, uh, most of these people are so close to subsistence, uh, if they produce a bit more surplus, they just ate it up. Yeah? Or there were some yeah, the rich farmers uh, who basically used it in the conspicuous uh, consumption. Yeah? So the, the logic said that, that, that we need to take this uh, surplus away from the agricultural tech sector through collectivization, yeah? so that uh, the government basically controls the agriculture sector and concentrate this uh, the extracted surplus in the hands of the investor, in this case, the GOSPLAN, yeah? the Central Planning Authority. Yeah? Now, typically, it wasn't actually his idea. Yeah? It was uh, the, an idea devised by this uh, the, the brilliant uh, economist uh, who is uh, now almost forgotten, Yevgeny Prebrozensky. Prebrozensky was uh, the leading economist of the left wing of the Soviet Communist Party. Initially, Stalin, who was on the right wing of the party, argued against this idea and drove Preobrazinski into exile in 1927. Hmm? <laughs> but upon becoming the sole dictator in the following year, Stalin took up the idea and went for agricultural collectivization. Hmm? Now, as you all know, Stalin's collectivization led to a persecution of the Kulak, the rich peasants, and a famine in which millions perished. Yeah? Three million is the sort of consensus number, but it could be even higher. So it uh, had tremendous cost, but it actually at least delivered on its central promise, yeah? higher investment and faster growth. Yeah? Because surplus was extracted, it was concentrated in ghost plan, ghost plan invested more, and then the economy grew faster. Yeah? Unfortunately, we cannot say the same about the free market version of Stalinism, that is, trickle-down economics. You know, despite concentrating wealth at an astonishing rate at the top, about which uh, Robert uh, has written quite a lot, and I highly recommend uh, his writings on that, investment and growth have actually fallen in the last three decades of free market capitalism. In other words, our rich have become more expensive to keep. Yeah? You know, we keep giving them more and more, and they are delivering less and less. Yeah? 
You know, I mean, they got a lot more uh, than before. So why are we having lower investment and lower growth? Huh? You know, we have to ask this question. Yeah? You know, I, I mean, as far as they do their job, I don't mind uh, these people having all the money. Yeah? But they are not doing their job. Yeah? That's uh, the, the, an important point. Okay, the next thing. People in poor countries are more entrepreneurial than people in rich countries. You know, this guy once famously said that the problem with the French is that they don't have the word for entrepreneurship. <laughs> he should have paid a bit more attention in his French class. <laughs> now, okay, I mean, that, that, that you can yeah, excuse uh, Dobia for not being very good at French, but actually this is a fairly common Anglo-American prejudice against the French. Yeah? I mean, France is a the undynamic and laid-back country, yeah? full of uh, striking workers and sheep-burning farmers and pompous waiters and yeah? what have you. Now, as I'll uh, tell you later, actually this conception of France is wrong. But the perspective behind this uh, statement is widely accepted, even by people who don't like uh, George W. Bush. You need enterprising people, you need entrepreneurial people in order to have a successful economy. Huh? In this view, the poverty of developing countries is attributed to the lack of entrepreneurship in those countries. So they go to developing countries and, uh, sorry, uh, people from rich countries uh, go to developing countries and visit places like this and say, ah, this is why they don't develop. Yeah? <laughs> the 11th cup of uh, the, the mint tea in the morning, yeah? smoking their hookahs away. You know. Look, I mean, that, uh, these people that uh, should uh, go, go out there and uh, make money. Yeah? But actually, that anyone who is uh, from a developing country or, or who has uh, lived uh, the, in one of them uh, for a period, will know that uh, these countries are actually teeming with entrepreneurs. Eh? You know, I mean, that, that, that these people. Yeah? In contrast, most, citizens, most uh, citizens of rich countries have not even come near to becoming an entrepreneur. You know, they mostly work for other people. Yeah? They mostly work for companies which are higher, yeah, tens of thousands of people doing highly specialized and narrowly specified jobs and in the process realizing someone else's entrepreneurial vision. Yeah, whereas uh, all these yeah, uh, but that, uh, people in the markets of Indonesia and Nigeria, that, uh, which are what uh, you are seeing there, are yeah, entrepreneurs. Yeah? Moreover, <coughs> sorry. In fact, uh, if you compare the numbers, you will see that the chance of someone from a developing country being an entrepreneur is anything between two and thirteen times higher than that for someone from a rich country. Yeah? You know, on average, and actually the, those figures are for poor countries that uh, underestimate the extent because it uh, is only for the urban sector. I mean, in the agricultural sector, the yeah, proportion of uh, self-employment is uh, even higher, but I mean, uh, uh, leave that aside. In poor countries, yeah, typically 30 to 50 percent of people work for themselves. In the rich countries, uh, the ratio is uh, that, uh, less than half that, quarter that, and actually in some countries it's even lower, and actually you see there that uh, the U.S is one of the least entrepreneurial country in the sense that uh, the proportion of people who are entrepreneurs are much lower than in you know, other developed countries, not to speak of countries like Ghana, Bangladesh, and Benin. Yeah? France does marginally better. So, you know, this was, I mean, the, the WS uh, comment was, 
a classic case of the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah? The difference between France and the United States is actually not as great as he thinks. Yeah? Moreover, the entrepreneurial skills of developing country entrepreneurs are tested to the limit because things go wrong all the time. Yeah? You know, the delivery doesn't arrive because of, uh, I don't know, uh, because the truck broke down because of a uh, portal in the road, yeah? I mean, the customs wouldn't clear your imports, yeah? You know, electricity is down again, yeah? The petty bureaucrats are, that are inventing new rules to extract uh, bribes, yeah? You know, you really have to be quick on your uh, feet uh, to deal with these situations. So how come, I mean, that, that, that all these people, yeah, trying to realize the entrepreneurial vision with uh, their skills are tested to the limit, how come they remain poor? Yeah? And my argument is that this is essentially because entrepreneurship is not an individualistic endeavor anymore if it ever was. Yeah? We need a whole host of uh, collective institutions to channel entrepreneurial energy into the right kind of high productivity activities. Yeah? The scientific infrastructure, the corporate institutions, the legal system, the financial system, and so on. So the developing country people have a lot of entrepreneurial energy. Yeah? A lot of people are entrepreneurs, but they do not have these uh, supporting institutions, and that's why they are poor. And this is exactly why, as I write in the chapter in the book and elsewhere in one of the papers that, uh, that you can download uh, from my website, uh, which I'll uh, show later, this is why the microfinance uh, program has delivered so little, actually, in terms of economic development, despite all the expectations. Eh? And this point actually nicely links back to thing three, where I emphasize the collective nature of individual productivity. Eh? You know, I mean, that we become so used to think that it's all down to individuals. Yes, I mean, individuals are important. I mean, uh, after I I mean, uh, believe in human agency, and I mean, uh, in a way, I mean, that uh, mainstream economic models uh, with assumptions of full ration rationality actually mm, undermines the very notion of agency because that, uh, when we are so rational, we know everything, yeah. there's uh, really no agency. Yeah. The structure is given, you are rational, you figure out the best way, and there's only one right course of action, there you go. Yeah. I don't believe in that kind of world, so I truly believe in the human agency, but emphasis on human agency shouldn't be confined to individuals. Eh? A lot of things are like that, uh, sorry, like what they are because of these uh, collective efforts, collective institutions accumulated over time. So if you begin to think purely in terms of uh, that, uh, individuals, that uh, you actually cannot uh, really understand uh, this uh, process. Anyway, I've talked too much, uh, probably. It, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but uh, while I wind up, uh, I'll, I'll let you have uh, a look at uh, the whole list of uh, 23 things. You know, in explaining these things in the book, I have tried my best to dispel the widespread perception that economics is too complicated for non-economists. You know, I say that 95% uh, of economics is common sense made deliberately complicated, while even the remaining 5% can be explained in essence, in plain terms, if not in all technical details. Huh? And what I wanted to do with the book uh, is uh, to equip my readers with some fundamental economic reasoning and some basic but often misunderstood facts about capitalism so that they can better exercise what I call in the book active economic citizenship and demand right courses of action from our policymakers and business leaders 
speed in relation to financial reform, inflation, welfare state, or development policy. You know, this is not easy. I mean, I often joke that the most difficult job in the world is that, uh, being a citizen of a democratic country, yeah? because you have to know everything. You have to have an opinion on everything. Yeah? You know, in other jobs, that, uh, your kind of, uh, the <laughs> task is uh, relatively limited and specialized. Yeah? But if you are, uh, that, that want to be an active citizen, you have to have an opinion on, well, I mean, everything from global warming to pension reform to yeah? child benefit to yeah? uh, kind of uh, CCTVs. Yeah? So the, a lot of people actually give up. Yeah? Uh, look, I mean, I don't that, uh, even understand my own finance. I mean, how can I comment on the global financial reform? Yeah? <laughs> but I, I, we, we have to make an effort yeah? because uh, that, that our refusal to engage uh, with these things, uh, or reluctance at least, is uh, that what uh, allows uh, some people to get away with murder. Huh? And when you think about it, uh, you don't need uh, the, uh, sophisticated economics to make judgments on these things. You know, I mean, I don't have a PhD in biology or epidemiology, but even I know that, uh, that uh, there should be some you know, hygiene standard in food factories and uh, restaurants. Huh? You, know, you don't need a PhD in finance to know that uh, leverage cannot go up to 5,000%. Yeah? Anyway, so it's uh, my sincere hope that uh, this uh, book uh, encourages that uh, people who normally not read economics and uh, think uh, economics is uh, someone else's uh, thing to yeah, get interested and uh, develop uh, the understanding. And if you want uh, more information, you can go to these uh, places and uh, find out uh, a bit more. But I'll uh, wind up uh, so that we can have uh, time for discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. There's lots of the same kind of wry humor uh, in the book, um, together with um, much more um, fleshed out and sustained um, argument um, than Hajun was able to deliver now. Um, just before um, we open it up, let me uh, illustrate just how powerful have been the ideas that and still are the ideas that Hajun is challenging. First of all, um, Hayek, Friedrich von Hayek, published a book in 1944 called Road to Serfdom, in which he argued that uh, the beverage welfare state that was then being put in motion um, represented the beginning of a slippery slope such that the curtailment of economic freedom, which the welfare state represented, would cause a curtailment of political freedom. There would then be a vicious spiral downwards such that um, as economic freedom was curtailed and political freedom was therefore curtailed, we would end up in the modern version of serfdom. This was Hayek's argument in 1944. The sales of that book have been surging in the United States since Obama became a presidential candidate and since he became, even more since he became president to the point where earlier this year it was number 240 on the Amazon bestsellers list. The reason is because Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaum, the Tea Party and other such entities have been promoting this book, published in 1944, The Road to Serfdom, as a guide to what the Obama Socialist Administration <laughs> is, is trying to do with um, health care, with uh, the bailout of the banks, and so on. Um, this is the roadmap, according to these people, and they have been so persuasive as to make sales of the book 240 on the Amazon bestsellers list. I, I find that really quite um, scary. By the way, Hayek taught at LSE, of course, 
and was one of the people Lionel Robbins um, fostered uh, to make LSC the bastion of anti-Keynesian economics. Um, second point, my friend Rafi Kaplinsky was having dinner with the permanent secretary of the Department of International Development some years ago, quite some years ago, and Rafi uh, mentioned to the permanent secretary that if he went across, he was then at the Institute of Development Studies, University of Sussex, a colleague of mine, he, he, if he went across the road and joined a firm that he'd been consulting for, he could double his salary just like that. And the permanent secretary of DFID looked at him and said, good heavens, well, you should do it. Um, the salary is the best indicator of your social value, he said. That is another illustration of just how powerful these um, ideas of the virtues of free markets um, have mm. become. And this is the context in which we are still living despite the kind of um, challenge to this way of seeing that the global economic crisis is, has thrown up. So with that, um, let me uh, remind you that there is a glaring hole in the book. He doesn't talk anything about environment or climate change, and maybe somebody would like to press him on that point. <laughs> so um, let's take uh, three questions at a time, and I'll begin right up at the back. So are you all right with three questions? Yeah. 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 Right up at the back. Hi there. Stephen Whitehead from the New Economics Foundation. Um, from the New Economics Foundation. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the inter arguments that you've made open up a really interesting intellectual space for governments to do more to try and control markets. But you haven't really talked at this stage about what they should do. And I wondered if you had any, and it's always a difficult question, any policies, prescriptions that, gov that the UK government can undertake now to try and um, control financial markets to improve well-being. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, there was somebody else in the gallery. Yes. Uh, Ken Rump from an investment bank. You don't really care which one. Um, the, the question was... Uh, we know it's not Lehman Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was really related to your one about the career versus the many failures. What are the, um, the lessons from careers development that, that can be made, if any, because um, it seems to me that the idea of the importance of institutions and governments isn't com governance isn't completely novel in, in develop thing development thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last one in the gallery, and then we'll come down. Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hi. My name is Usman. I'm from SOAS. I'm a student of politics, and uh, of all the points that you know, I saw, um, I found I was re really hoping you'd bring this up. Uh, number four. The washing machine has changed the world more than the oh, internet. Right, yeah. I'm actually fascinated to know exactly how do you come to that conclusion. <laughs> okay, over to you. Right. Um, yeah, I, I do make uh, quite a few concrete proposals uh, throughout the book and also the, summarize them uh, in the uh, concluding chapter. So the, you can read those uh, and get the details. But yeah, basically in the, the British case, I see that the task is uh, to restore balances. Eh? Balances between the state and market, balances between the finance and industry, balances between the, the uh, sorry, finance and the, 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 the real economy, and, and balances between the finance and services. Eh? You know, let me give you one illustration. The ratio between the total value of uh, financial assets in the world economy and world output, of course, I mean, these two are kind of different figures, so uh, I'm not saying that is, they, they can be directly compared, but uh, that used to be like a 1.2 in the early 1970s. Eh? These days it's 4.4. 4. 4. 4 which means that uh, to produce the same unit of output, we need nearly four times more financial assets than before. Why? You know, I, mean, I have nothing against uh, finance, uh, that, that, that mushrooming, if it actually 
makes the economy uh, bigger. But uh, we now have, yeah, I mean, the same, I don't know, the, 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 the poor guy in New Orleans uh, the, 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 the trying to make his ends meet uh, while repaying mortgage, yeah, compared to the 40 years ago, the, there are four times more claims on his activities. Yeah? Why? Yeah? I mean, these uh, things uh, need to be looked at. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, the, the, I, the, the, to paraphrase, Winston Churchill, the, I, I think uh, the capitalism is uh, the worst economic system except for all the others. Huh? So, I mean, I'm not anti-capitalist as uh, some people are. I mean, I think uh, this is uh, the, the best uh, what we ha uh, uh, system that we have. But my problem is that uh, the particular variety of capitalism that we have practiced, this uh, finance-driven free market capitalism, hasn't uh, served the humanity very well. Now, Korea versus uh, failures. Yeah, actually, the, this is a point that I have been making probably the, 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 for a good 10 years uh, since I published my book, Kicking Out the Ladder, in the 2002 and one or two things before that. You know, people like to portray Korea as an exception that uh, proves the rule. Actually, it is not an exception. Eh? Because the strategy that Korea used to develop its economy, the selective industrial policy, yeah, government mobilizing uh, the surpluses and uh, con controlling capital flows and so on. I mean, these are policies that virtually all of today's rich countries have used in order to develop their economy. Yeah? This strategy actually was invented in Britain yeah? by Robert Walpole, the first prime minister. Yeah? And it was uh, the, the copied and, and uh, theorized uh, by the Americans. Yeah? You know, the famous infant industry argument was invented by none other than Alexander Hamilton, the first ever Treasury Secretary of the United States. Yeah? And then the Germans uh, learned it from the Americans and copied it, and the Japanese uh, copied it from the Germans, and the Koreans copied it from the Japanese, and so on. Yeah? So, yes, I mean, that. that when people say, oh, you know, for every Korea there are 100 failures, uh, I ask uh, that, that, that these people then, how do you explain all these other 30 yeah, countries that have become rich uh, essentially using the same yeah, policies? I mean, same, not in exact form, but uh, in terms of the spirit that is you need to nurture and protect your young industries when you are a backward economy. Yeah? The washing machine, actually, this uh, has been quite extensively discussed uh, in my interview with uh, the Observer newspaper with uh, my picture with the washing machine. Uh, <laughs> so you can uh, read that. But yeah, very briefly, the, the point is that you know, we tend to get uh, fascinated by the most recent changes. Huh? Yeah, and, and the, 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 the internet revolution is happening now. It has uh, changed a lot of things, but when you uh, think through it, actually it has changed mainly our leisure life. You know? I mean, in terms of work life, uh, actually there's very little evidence that uh, the internet has increased uh, productivity. You know? And actually it has uh, made, at least in offices, uh, shirking very easy. You know, I do that. Yeah? I watch uh, the, 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 my, yeah, the, 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 my favorite uh, the, the sports uh, the broadcast uh, in my office, yeah? You know, I, I read newspapers, yeah? In contrast, uh, the, the washing machine, I mean, it isn't just washing machine, but the, 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 the washing machine and associated household technologies like pipe water and you know, pipe gas, yeah? I mean, electric Hoover and so on, they have basically enab enabled uh, women uh, to go out and on independent income. Yeah? And this has uh, changed the whole host of things. Yeah? The power relationship within the household, yeah? the number of children we have, the timing of uh, the, the, the children that we have, and yeah? I mean, the, the abolishment of a profession like uh, domestic servants. Yeah? You know, I mean, that, uh, say you go to Egypt, uh, something like 10% of the population is uh, hired as domestic servant, 
you go to Sweden, the ratio is 0.005 percent. Yeah? So put together, these are the really monumental changes. I'm not saying that internet that that uh, in the end may, yeah. I mean, even in the future, that that, that, that may not change things uh, as much as uh, the washing machine has. But at least so far, the evidence is uh, pretty limited. And even in terms of uh, sheer speed, you know, I mean, the, yeah, internet has uh, the other revolutionary features like the search capability and. You know, uh, ability to send pictures and so on, but in terms of pure speed, it isn't actually that revolutionary. Huh? The real revolution was that uh, when they laid that, that, that cable under the Atlantic uh, to send telegraph. Huh? Before that, it took, used to take like three, well, if you are really lucky, that, that two and a half weeks uh, to send a message across the Atlantic. Huh? With uh, the, the telegraph, the time was reduced to what, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah? This is a reduction in the order of uh, two, three thousand times. Yeah? The internet has reduced uh, the speed from what uh, the thirty seconds that uh, takes on fax machine to say three seconds. Yeah? Is it actually not that revolutionary? Huh? <laughs> you know, internet gets a lot of press because uh, people who write about these things have benefited a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole book with uh, my friend Eileen Grable, the, who teaches in Colorado, the Denver, Colorado, with just one face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah? Everything else was uh, done on the internet. Yeah? So, yeah, so for someone like me, my work life has been transformed. Yeah? But does it mean that actually it has had big social impact? Maybe. Yeah? Does it mean that it has a hu had a huge economic impact? I don't think so. Yeah? So, well, I mean, if you are intrigued, uh, uh, please uh, read, uh, the, read the book, yeah? <laughs> Just a qualification on your argument um, that you're, uh, you're um, critical of a, a particular type of capitalism, mm -hmm. finance-driven capitalism, but it, a distinction has to be made between at least two types of finance capitalism. In the Belle Epoque, around the turn of the 20th century, um, financiers the big financiers were very powerful mm -hmm. and they were sitting on the boards of the big oligopolies that were driving the new mass production industries. Yeah, yeah. The difference today, I mean since the 1980s, mm -hmm. is that finance has become, yes, very powerful but also quite detached from exactly, production yeah. in yeah. a way that the Belle Epoque financiers yeah were not to the point where finance is generating huge profits by, fan by financing finance. Mm -mm. That's the paradox. That's right. Finance is financing finance, mm -hmm. far removed from production. And that is part of the reason why it has become so parasitic. Yeah. No, no, exactly. I mean, uh, without uh, modern financial institutions like uh, the, the banking and mm -hmm limited liability companies, uh, we would uh, still be living in yeah, the Adam Smith's uh, pin factory world. Yeah? So the, these financial the, the institutions have been very important. Yeah? And actually, uh, paradoxically, the, one of the people who first uh, saw it, uh, as I discussed in the Thing 2, was Karl Marx. Yeah? You know, in his time, a lot of uh, free market economies were against uh, limited liability companies because they thought it creates, in modern terms, moral hazard, which it does. But Marx said, well, I mean, never mind that, that uh, it that, uh, allows a huge uh, that, uh, mobilization of huge uh, the amount of capital, which uh, allows uh, the implementation of uh, the, the, the new technologies, and this is uh, capitalist uh, production in its highest form. Yeah? I mean, of course, uh, he supported it that, uh, because uh, the, he thought this will eventually lead to socialism because uh, the, this will yeah, lead to yeah, uh, separation between ownership and management. And then when that happens, you can just uh, that, uh, kick out the owners yeah, because uh, they are not really doing anything. Yeah? And then the, the, the managers uh, can be yeah, the, the party officials or whatever. So he had a uh, hidden agenda, but uh, you know, he was able to see how these uh, the institutions are the, the doing very powerful, positive things. Unfortunately, as uh, Robert put it very well, I mean, now it's uh, the, the, the finance uh, for its own sake. Yeah? Okay, let's take three more questions. I'll take them from down here. Yes. 
Good evening. My name is Tania Dimitrova from Queen Mary University. Um, my question won't come as a surprise, but you do seem to avoid the topic of uh, environmental constraints to economic growth mm -hmm. and uh, sustainable development. And unless you have a really good reason to avoid it, could you please talk a little bit more about it? Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm from LSE. Um, I want to over, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, I want to go back to the washing machine uh, question and um, kind of say that I come from a country that has um, managed to overturn the government through Twitter overnight, uh, with you know more than twenty thousand people coming up. Um, this is Moldova. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, because in the book you, you just talk about internet as, as email connection or connectivity, and, but you don't really touch upon information and um, you know, just you know, getting people to motivate, motivated to, or mobilized. Mm -hmm. And uh, my second thing is, um, uh, you know, thing two and three and 13 are very, based on um, kind of a relative approach, global versus local. And I was wondering, say, you, you say in the book um, what uh, actions should be taken, but you don't mention by who, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Uh. <laughs> no, no, I'm not sure whether I understand the, the question, I mean, global versus local. Um. So, so, for example, uh, Use the mic. For example, the driver, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's in terms of mobility and should be, it's, it's an approach to economics rather than local economics, global economics. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, uh, if there is uh, mobility to be increased or liberalized, that is kind of like a, a, a global issue and who should, you know, deal with that? Right, 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 okay. Okay, and at the back? Yes. Hi there. Uh, you said early on in your talk. Sorry, can you just you identify yourself? Uh, my name's Liam. Uh, this is my <laughs> <laughs> um, you said in your in your speech about your book that you wish the rich would do their jobs. Um, in that case, you wouldn't have so much of a problem with them, as you no doubt more are aware that most financing of entrepreneurial and business activity takes place through banks and central banks. And I was wondering what you thought. Um, the role of central banks and banks should be in a democratic capitalist society, and whether you think that the actual nature uh, and nature and role of money is uh, something that should be maybe number 24 on your list. Hmm. Uh, meaning what? The role of money, what, what specifically do you have in mind? Well, uh, focusing on the nature of it, um, the idea, I, th I think what came through from your talk was that this idea of t money is quite a tangible thing and that the rich redistribute it amongst people that are in need of it for entrepreneurial activity. As we know, the modern financial system doesn't work like that. And um, banks are redistributing uh, or, or handing out financial assets to people that are, haven't been deposited with them. And I'm wondering whether the n very nature of money and financial instruments is something that is misunderstood by people as, as when they perceive capitalism and whether that's the thing that should be on the end of the list, that money itself is misunderstood. Hmm. Right. Um, on the question of environment, well, I don't have a chapter because I don't think I have anything interesting or new to say. And it's not because I don't think it's uh, unimportant. You know, I mean, there are lots of important things that I could have said but uh, didn't because I don't know much about it. So it's uh, the, not but a uh, hugely political decision. Um, washing machine, yes, I mean, the, the internet has uh, the, the done those things, but I don't know, I mean, you have to uh, put it into perspective. I mean, I think uh, there were more revolutions uh, before the internet than uh, there are now, because uh, people are you know, that, uh, probably distracted by frivolous things on the internet. Uh, no, no, I mean, that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not that, that, that. I mean, uh, saying that uh, uh, things like what you have said uh, is uh, irrelevant, but, uh, you know, 
once again, I mean, uh, please uh, read my book. I mean, I give just a few examples, but you know, you, you, we, we tend to uh, think uh, things that are happening now, things that have uh, happened uh, very recently are uh, necessarily more important, but you know, uh, that's uh, not necessarily the case. Um, yeah, I think uh, your point about uh, the global and local, after I understood it, that uh, is uh, very good, very important. You know, in whose benefits, uh, from whose points of view are we devising these policies? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, once again, take the case of uh, immigration. Yeah? You know, I mean, if you have a job, in a rich country, which uh, other people cannot easily take away, you will actually benefit from having the freest possible immigration because uh, your restaurant bills will go down and uh, you, are, you, know, uh, that, uh, you are probably able to hire a chauffeur now and all that. You know? But when this immigration uh, happens, uh, the, uh, local people who used to do those jobs uh, lose their jobs. You know? So it's uh, very bad for them. You know? and I, mean, I have a chapter discussing whether the U.S. truly has uh, the highest living standard in the world. And the one point I make is that, that uh, the reason why purchasing power of uh, the, the Americans are so much greater than the purchasing power of uh, the other countries is uh, mainly because uh, it has uh, cheap services uh, for a country of that level of income. Yeah? I mean, this is great if uh, you are a consumer, but if you are a waitress or taxi driver, it sucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, for example, if you take uh, the same, say, five-mile uh, taxi ride in Boston, you pay something like uh, fifteen dollars. Yeah? The same taxi ride in Geneva will cost you thirty-five dollars. Yeah. So the money actually goes uh, mostly to the, to the taxi driver. Yeah? So uh, if you are the, the passenger, yes, uh, it's great that uh, you have all these uh, that, uh, unemployed medical doctors from Nigeria that are driving taxis in New York and driving down the taxi fare. But if you are that guy driving the taxi, it's not great. Yeah? But I think uh, that these are I mean, really difficult questions. Yeah? In whose interest are we yeah, devising these policies? Central bank, yes. I mean, I uh, believe that uh, central banks uh, should be politically controlled. I mean, this that uh, idea of central bank independence, uh, I find that uh, very that, uh, problematic because, you know, there's this that, 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 uh, presumption that uh, central bankers are politically neutral technocrats. No, they are not. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, that, that are by nature yeah, kind of uh, that, uh, in favor of uh, the financial industry. Yeah? So when you leave uh, these people independent, uh, they'll do policies that are kind of, uh, inherently favorable to finance at the cost of jobs and growth. Yeah? So you have to uh, control these people. Yeah? You know, the, the, the one brilliant thing that uh, the neoliberals have uh, pulled off is uh, to convince the world that every important decision should be taken out of democracy. Yeah? So give it to independent central bank. Yeah, the World Bank has been advocating independent revenue agency, yeah? independent uh, industry regulators. Yeah? Why do you then have a uh, democracy? Yeah? So the central bank, uh, the independence uh, that, that should be put in that context. Yeah? I mean, if you give uh, that uh, independence to these uh, unelected you know, technocrats, you are handing them you know, uh, the power that uh, cannot be controlled uh, by your democratic institutions, and that uh, uh, you have reduced the importance of your democracy uh, by so much. Yeah? On the question of nature of money, I have nothing intelligent to say. So let's uh, leave it there. But uh, when I use the expression money, I don't necessarily mean money in the economic sense. I mean that, yeah, I mean that, that, that you could uh, say that I'm talking about yeah, surplus and yeah, income and so on. So I mean, uh, when I say money, I don't necessarily mean money in the yeah, strict sense. On the subject of central banks and banking, um, let me just uh, mention two excellent films that are just about to 
come out. The first one is called The Flaw, uh, as in um, F-L-A-W rather than F-L-O-O-R. The Flaw, which takes its title from Alan Greenspan's testimony to Congress in which he admitted he had discovered a flaw in his ideology. Um, his ideology being that shareholders would always make sure that their company did not take unnecessary risks uh, to its survival. Uh, and then he discovered that they would. Um, and this film is by David Sinkton, and it's about how this great crisis uh, came upon us, um, with a particular emphasis on the role of income distribution and wealth distribution in generating financial fragility. The second film is called Inside Job by Charles Ferguson, and it contains some truly astonishing interviews with bankers. Um, I'll leave it there, mm. but look out for these two films. Um, we have time for, I think, just another yeah, quick uh, round. Yes, one, yes. There's some upstairs too. Okay, this is thing. <laughs> one. Yes, thank you. My name is Nita and I'm from Mauritius. I'm a member of parliament of the Labour Party there. Um, my one question... You're, you're a member of parliament? Yes, of Mauritius. Mm. Ah. Uh, and a member of the Labour Party. Um, my question would be, again, uh, with the environment, but with a specific uh, question of, given that three quarters of the world population live in sun-drenched uh, areas, why do you think photovoltaic solar technology is still so prohibitive uh, in order to uh, respond to uh, mm -hmm. renewable energy? And the, the question that I can't help myself asking is about thing 20. Why do you think equality of opportunities is not fair? Mm -hmm. um, yes, there was a question over here. N Nalima? No. Nalima Govrajani, um, Department of International Speak Development. Speak up. Sorry, Department of International Development and Government Department. Um, if Ed Miliband were to take you out for lunch, which I understand he That might famous be, lunch, yeah. He might be doing. Speak uh, up. Sorry, if Ed Miliband were to take you out for lunch, as I understand he might be doing, if he hasn't done so already, um, what would you tell him about the austerity measures that the coalition um, government is introducing? Is it striking the balance that you think the UK needs, um, or is it not? Okay, I think this will be the last one. Yes, in the gallery. Um, bef before your book came out, the big selling economics books in this country in recent times have all been, it seems to me, to do with behavioral economics. What is your view of that sort of uh, approach to economics? Uh, w which one, sorry? Behavioral economics. Oh, behavior, your, yeah. Um, your view of behavioral yeah. economics. Okay. Just a right. Few Okay, um, yes, I mean, the, the problem with uh, the lack of uh, photovoltaic technology is uh, that people who have the capabilities uh, to develop those technologies uh, don't want them. Eh? Uh, basically, the, the problem is that the rich countries have the capabilities uh, to develop these technologies, but uh, it's uh, the, not in their interest uh, to do it. I mean, they would rather you know, kind of invade uh, Iraq and uh, get more oil. I mean, a lot easier, you know. So the, there is uh, that uh, fundamental mismatch between needs and capabilities. Huh? And as for uh, this proposition, the equality of opportunity may not be fair. I mean, I wasn't saying that it that, that, uh, should be uh, rejected. I mean, uh, what I was uh, trying to say in that uh, chapter is that it is only the starting point. Huh? You know, would you call a race fair? simply because no one is allowed to have a head start if you know, half the contestants have only one leg. Yeah? You know, I mean, that, that this is a serious point. I mean, that, that rich countries say, oh, developing countries uh, should uh, play by the same rule. Yeah? I mean, people with yeah, kind of, uh, the money and good education say that, 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 that these poor kids uh, should uh, that, uh, that, uh, compete on uh, equal terms. Yeah? No, I mean, that's not enough. So that, uh, I was uh, trying to argue that you need some degree of uh, equality of outcome in order to ensure that uh, equality of opportunity has a uh, true meaning. Yeah? Right, 
Nilimos, yeah, ta, ta, ta. When it uh, talked about the uh, lunch with Ed Miliband, uh, she was uh, the referring to this editorial article in The Guardian, which uh, recommended that uh, Ed Miliband takes me out to lunch. So if it happens, it will be the, the, the first uh, example of uh, the, the, the arranged uh, lunch, yeah? as in arranged marriage. Yeah? Um, well, without assuming anything about the lunch, uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, this uh, austerity plan of the conservative government uh, is wrong in so many ways. I mean, first of all, the origins. Yeah, I was uh, listening to Ian Duncan Smith uh, on radio yesterday. He was talking as if uh, that, that this deficit was created by the Labour Party throwing money center left and right. No, this was mainly created by the banking crisis. Yeah? So that, that, that they, first of all, got the you know, diagnosis wrong. And secondly, yeah, they keep uh, talking about that, that, that devising a fair, fairer system, but you know, that people have caused this accident that, that should uh, bear the blunt of, uh, that, sorry, the bulk of the, the, the burden, whereas uh, that, you know, I mean, the, they, they, the, I mean, in coming up with this uh, bank levy, that, that they surprised the bankers if, uh, by coming up with uh, a figure that was uh, that considered too low even by the bankers. Huh? <laughs> and in macroeconomic terms, yeah, if you cut your deficit too far too quickly, you are going to push your economy into recession again. Yeah? This is why when Spain a few months ago announced this uh, austerity plan, Moody's immediately downgraded his uh, credit rating. Yeah? Because they knew that if you cut the, the deficit in that kind of way, you are going to the, push the economy back into recession. Yeah? But you know, one thing I don't understand in this debate is, uh, I mean, why are people so obsessed with dates? Yeah? Dates do not have any meaning in economics. Yeah? Why do you need to cut it in half by 2014 or yeah, cut, cut it by 70% by 2015. You know, I mean, uh, if you have economic reasoning, you should say things like, yeah, we will yeah, cut this much, uh, the, the, but may stop if the economy takes a downturn, if uh, the, the yeah, uh, manufacturing production index falls below this. I mean, you have to use indicators that have economic meaning. Yeah? 2013, 2014 doesn't have any meaning. Yeah? Uh, this is a uh, death by number. Yeah? Yeah. So the, uh, and then on top of that, uh, the you know, coalition has this uh, agenda to roll back the welfare state, which I uh, do not agree with because I uh, argue in thing 21 that uh, the, the welfare state is the bankruptcy law of the, the workers. And we need that actually to encourage the, the workers uh, to take uh, the, the initiative and risk. Yeah? So yes, uh, where do I stop? Yeah, okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Behavioral economics. Yes, I mean that I the, actually talk about Herbert Simon, the father of behavioral economics, a lot in uh, my book. So I'm. I mean, uh, favorably inclined uh, to that school, but you know, I mean, uh, the, there are many different types of behavioral economics, and you know, if you are uh, the, talking about you know, the, those things that we saw in more popular kind of uh, the economics books uh, recently, I'm not entirely sure whether I like it. But uh, there's a great book uh, written by University of Michigan psychology professor called uh, Free Market Madness, and uh, he actually has uh, a lot of very interesting uh, the, the behavioral research uh, the, the, uh, backing up uh, his uh, argument, uh, analyzing yeah, how market behaviors can be very irrational and so on. Uh, What's uh, his name? Uh, it's uh, the, in the book, uh, in my book. I forgot the... Uh, Well, another reason to buy the book, huh? <laughs> and what is, what is the title then? Free Market Madness. Free Market yeah. Madness, okay. Okay, so I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. Okay. Uh,